what we're seeing is we're seeing the European Union becoming much more militarized and we're seeing that uh, the cost of this will be borne by ordinary working class people. These are the people who will who will pay the price for more military, both in terms of direct war. And this has to be a, a fear for all of us, um, outside force, which at the moment NATO um, has ruled out and won't uh, won't do. But I think overall this will lead to a strengthening of NATO. It will lead to more um, uh, money being spent on arms. It will also question the whole um, history of. Uh, yeah, I think NATO will come out of this um, with strengthened in the sense that it, this war is definitely a ratchet up in terms of possibility of conflict between not just regional powers, which has been wars, you know, when you think of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, these were very une unequal opponents, if you like. Russia is a much smaller imperialism, much smaller economy than uh, the United States and much smaller than the number of the um, European powers. Nonetheless, it is a major uh, imperial power and it has nuclear weapons and of course NATO itself don't have nuclear weapons but we know that the US, the UK and France do have and uh, any conflict obviously is between these states is obviously going to be very very serious. To many people including many people on the left they think okay why shouldn't we send arms to the Ukrainians to help them? This is arming the Ukrainian army, the regular army, by um, NATO forces. There are huge numbers of arms and other military equipment pouring into Ukraine at the moment. This is what's going on. There's calls for volunteers to go and fight in the Ukrainian army. And this is not a guerrilla army. This is a regular army. And the people who do go and fight will be incorporated into that. Um, I think to send more arms is just putting petrol on the flame or, or, or what is already a flaming situation and will end disastrously. And you have to remember all the um, the arms that were flooded into Syria. Um, what happened to them? A, a lot of them ended up in the hands of ISIS. I mean, you you know, you can't control what happens to these weapons, obviously, once they're in a war situation, the other side can capture them, all sorts of things can happen to them. So it's really, it, it's, a, it's a quick soundbite and it's a thing that people say, don't we have to do something? Well, the best thing we can do in these situations is to campaign against this war, but to say that all the imperial powers are playing major roles in, escalating military conflict. This has been the pattern of the last 30 years. And unfortunately, Russia invasion of the Ukraine, Ukraine is the latest example of this. Um, and I think more and more people will become aware of this. And the more that they will begin to see, firstly, that this war has complex origins. It isn't just decided to invade Ukraine. There's lots of history here and there's lots of role of the, of the Western powers, but also that this war isn't in the interest, obviously, of the people of Ukraine or in the interests of the people of Russia, but it's not in the interest of anybody in Europe or, or elsewhere in the world. It can only make the world a more dangerous. So, uh, and I think people, once people, as wars go on, people begin to see much more of the truth about them and begin to see that they are not something that, uh, that benefits anybody. So I have a great deal of... Um, faith in people and I also know that previous wars have ended I heard a Russian speaker actually saying that if you look in Russia um, the Crimean war led to big political change the emancipation of the serfs um, the Russo-Japanese war led to the revolution of 1905 the first world war led to the uh, revolution of 1917 um, and I think you have to you can't say that any of these countries you're going to see um, this situation again, but I think you can say there will be big political upheavals.